in a very large sense, we create the reality that we live in, all of us together, all of us collectively, with all of our intents and all of our choices. That's what creates our future. That's what creates our reality. And you can modify that future with an intent. We're talking with Tom Campbell, physicist, author, expert on consciousness. I love your information. I love the the ways that you encourage people to think and explore. And I'm really looking forward to talking with you. Well, it's good to be here, Wendy. Uh, thanks for uh, the invitation. The thing I liked about reading your books was you start at the beginning when you're uh, when you're a kid and you're you know you talk about being in the child's body and traveling out of out of body and being an adult. When you're a kid and you know you can get out of the body and you've got guides, you've got help, you've got assistance. What is that like having to go back into the day to day of pretending or leaving being quiet about that because your world was already super, super advanced in terms of knowing there was more going on than meets the eye. Well, you know, that really wasn't a problem because I had an awareness, even though I was only, you know, six, seven years old, I had an awareness that the two realms were separate and that um, you didn't, uh, you know, you, you, you didn't try to blend the two very well. So I tended to just keep it to myself. And that was just an intuitive knowing that I didn't uh, talk about it to other people. I didn't talk about it to my parents or uh, anybody else. It just was my private world, and I knew it was real because I had explored it and and, uh, had had, uh, been there many times, but it was mine, and uh, I didn't have that that problem. Now, after a while, uh, if as you read the books, you'll see that uh, that period of going out of body nightly and interacting with guides and so on, that, that ended. And the reason that it ended was because the, well, we'll just say the guides, but uh, uh, whatever intelligence was managing on the other side decided that I would, it might become a little too weird in this reality, that I wouldn't uh, be able to be as successful in this reality if I knew too much or got too involved in other reality, so it stopped so that I could kind of grow up normal here on this uh, physical reality without um, without access to that, at least for a while. But then, you know, later in life, it all came back, and all the memories came back as well at the same time. So there is a there is a need to keep it separate to some extent because, as you say, you can't explain it. People don't get it. You only make yourself sound like you're insane or crazy or have a very vivid imagination or a fool or, you know, all those other things. Because when you talk to people about something that they have never experienced, um, you just, you know, they just can't get it. You can't communicate that to them. So keeping, uh, you know, kind of living a dual life, if you will, or having these experiences and not sharing them is just a... It's just the way it is. At least back in those times, that's the way it is. Now, today, there's hundreds of books out there about out-of-body and people's experiences, and there's lots of people who've had that experience. So it's a little bit of a different world that you probably can run into people that you can share things with and that have had similar experiences. But that wasn't the case in, in uh, you know when I, was, when I was young. So it was just an intuitive knowing that I ought to keep these two worlds separate. Well, and that part, I think, on your behalf was a self-preservation. It was really, you know, just knowing that intuitive, like you said, that, okay, this isn't something I take out and tell tell the folks just yet. The other thing I want to say, though, is that, yeah, the, the, the landscape has changed incredibly. But my partner, when he was a kid, he did the same kind of exploring, and they shut him back in the box because he was running amok. And he and his sister at one point brought home a flower from somewhere else, a little exotic flower, and put it on the couch. And only in the last two or three years, they fessed up to mom. And she said, I wondered where that came from. But she didn't, she didn't ask. Life went on. It was, she just, and things like that have happened when you're talking to people who have had shamanic experiences or in other cultures where this isn't quite so far-fetched. They don't have that mindset of everything has to be scientific or it doesn't exist. And, you know, we're still doing science that doesn't exist. <laughs> yes, yeah, you know, they've, yeah. Take, they've taken some uh, questionnaires or surveys of, of uh, how many people have had paranormal experiences. 
and they expected to find something like 10 or 20 percent. Instead, they found close to 80 percent. So it's, though it is mostly kept personal and not talked about a whole lot, as it turns out, it's the you know, it's a large majority within our population that have had experiences. Now, all those paranormal experiences weren't out-of-body experiences, but uh, probably some, you know, some fair number of them were. And well, it's that's... not that unusual for young children to have out-of-body experiences. And they tell their parents about them, and the parents just say, oh, you were dreaming, or, you know, or no, that's not true, or stop talking about that or whatever, and it just never goes anywhere. It's not encouraged because the parents, of course, don't really know anything about it. Well, it's frightening if it's outside your uh, your knowledge base, and it's like, okay, I don't want to have a conversation because I don't know where it's going, and that could be a problem. Usually, like a good attorney, you want to know the answer before you ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. like, don't ask a question you don't have the answer to in advance because then you know if they're telling you the truth. Um, basically... If, and if you're following along, the three books, this, this is a trilogy, and My Big Toe, My Big Theory of Everything, Thomas Campbell, who's a consciousness researcher. When you, when you started going out of body and you knew there were other realities, can you share a little bit about what some of those realities were that you just kind of took for granted? Well, you know, the first couple of times that I got out of body, it was really because some, some non-physical entity showed up. And, uh, you know, helped me do that. And it was part of a, what's, what I, I found out later, of course, it was part of a uh, kind of a training program, if you will. And the first time that I got out of body, it was just kind of amazing because there I was. I was outside, you know, well, I was, actually, I was, I was in the air floating around in my room. And uh, I thought, well, that's, this is nifty, you know, this kind of an interesting place to be. I wonder what I can do with this. So I used my intent to move around a bit and I could go up and down and back and forth. And then I went out through a wall and I thought that was going to hurt, but I went right through the wall and then down toward the ground. And after a while, I started just to play with it, you know, um, just sliding around, sort of ice skating without ice or skates, you know, uh, mm -hmm. just kind of zipping around in and around my neighborhood and uh, that was just a, you know, a lot of fun. And that was my very first experience was one of just play, really, playing with the, uh, with, with the the idea that my perception could be other places other than connected with my body, and that this perception was not contained by things like walls and not affected by things like gravity, and all of that was just a, a gee whiz and you know, a lot of fun. So that was my first experience. Then after that, I got other experiences that had to do with using one's intent, using one's mind in order to control what one sees or interacts with or how that interaction goes, um, that sort of thing, because you, you are habituated to having to do everything physically. So it takes a little bit of training before you learn that this world now that you're in, this out-of-body world, you don't affect it physically. You interact with it with your intention. And that's kind of non-intuitive to begin with, but that's why it takes a little training to you get to the point that you realize that your intent is everything. So you'll well, you run into kind people, of... you'll, you'll run into events, you'll have conversations, and all of it is, all of it is, is mental. All of it is intent. That part, I think, does it really um, involves discipline. It does. And it, ha it requires, you know, the, the biggest discipline that you have to, uh, to acquire is to quiet your mind so that your mind is a stable, quiet source of this intent. Because most of our minds are jumping around from this thing to that thing. We don't you know, we probably don't think about the same thing for more than a few seconds where it jumps to something else and then jumps back to the original thing. Our minds are very undisciplined and very um, erratic, jump around a lot from idea to idea to thought to what about this, what about that, what's going to have for supper tonight, where am I going to go now, you know, about the thing at work, you know, and then my friends, they're having this kind of problem, and our minds are flying all over the place with all the things going on in our life. And you have to let all that go. You have to quiet that mind to where you can hold it in just a still, quiet position 
with no external thoughts whatsoever. And then you have a platform by which you can use your intent to um, you know, do orderly things. But until you quiet that mind with some discipline, you just um, you know, basically are uncoordinated in your, in your attempts to interact with the larger consciousness system. Well, in a way, it's like having this tremendous well and leaving the drain open or turning the faucet on because that's all that, that thoughts. As long as those thoughts are doing that, you're losing all of the power and all of the, the wonderful wealth of, of potential that's there if you keep it in some way, shape, or form contained. And you learn to do that, though, without a whole lot of effort. It's, it's a, I think, a delight and a a wonderful um, opportunity, especially if you're listening right now, to have this wonderful asset and this person who can be a teacher, a guide, a leader, a mentor, and somebody who just says, a way shower, somebody who just says, it's it's there and you can do it. You don't have to have any special tool or any special role or any special ritual. This stuff is out there. It's all a natural part of who we are. It does help, though, to start in baby steps. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. You have to start at the beginning and take little steps because otherwise you, you know, we'd be like, um, you know, it's like learning how to swim. You know, you just don't go out to the deep water and, you know, jump in the middle, you know, of the, of the river or something because that's not a clever way to learn how to swim. You, you need to uh, start. Uh, on the edge where it's safe and build up your strength and build up your ability and your strokes and your, you know, that sort of thing. And then you can move out to the deeper parts. And it's like that here too. Not that there's, not there's a big danger of drowning or anything. It's just that uh, you have to build up your skills and build up your, your uh, discipline and understand where you are because now you're in a new environment. And if you're in a new environment, you're, you're in the same position that any explorer is in is that you have no idea about what this environment's like and you just have to begin to explore it and try to understand it. So it's, yeah. it's not like you just, you know, are in some place that's just very similar to this physical reality. You're in a place that is nothing at all like this physical reality and you have to start uh, exploring it. And until you explore it, you have no idea what to do or how to do it or what to go, where to go, what's there. You're just kind of lost and in and adrift in this unusual space, this unusual world, and you don't really have any facility to interact with it, at least not consistently. So all that takes time. But you're right, it is available to anybody because we are consciousness. That's, that's what we are fundamentally, and any consciousness can, you know, can learn to uh, um, get around and explore these realms of consciousness. The one thing I do know that you can't, you really, um, if you want to run amok and your intent is to disrupt and to cause problems, it backfires because you really have no idea just how extensive this, these realms and these realities are. And it's like being a tiny gnat on the surface of the kitchen counter. And there you are going, oh, wow, I'm really powerful. I, I escaped from my, my box that they kept me in. And then you're still a gnat. <laughs> and and yes. um, I've, seen, I've seen instances where people have been, you know, basically bopped on the head and said, no. One guy told me, he said, I, I was so good, I could implant. You talk about this a little bit. Implant my desire or my thought in somebody else and have them do what I wanted them to. And he said, I had a, I don't remember what, what it was, but it was, a, it resulted in a concussion. He said, and I can't get it back. The deal from my end, the other side had a little hand in that because the things he was doing were interfering with free will. And they were, they're kind of, um, apparently they were also not in line with his bigger self and he was just taken out of action very effectively. And he said, I want to get that back. And I, and I knew it wasn't going to come back until he changed his reason for wanting to do it. It was about control. Can you get into any of that? Oh, yes. Well, you know, it's, it's not like the this, this system is, it's not like you just kind of open a door and, and you end up you know, walking through the door and now you're in China. You know, it's not like that. Um, this is a system of consciousness that you're exploring, and this larger consciousness system is an intelligent aware system, and you're a piece of that intelligent aware system. That's why you have intelligence and awareness, because you're a piece of the system. And there's a point 
in this system. It has a purpose, and that purpose is to evolve and to survive, just like our purpose, and to lower its entropy because it's an information system, and that's how information systems survive, by squeezing out randomness, if you will, and uh, creating content. And if you are out there um, increasing entropy instead of decreasing, if you're out there running amok and, and causing uh, things to, uh, um, you know, well, let's put it this way, if you're problematical, if you're, if, you're being, if you're getting in the way, if you're interfering with others' free will in the example you have, then the system is only going to tolerate so much of that. If it's part of your learning then it'll probably, just like a, a, you know, a naughty child, you know, you can kind of move them along and distract them and you know, keep them from doing that and maybe still let them have access to the toys that they were misusing, but uh, with more parental guidance, if you will. Or right. mm-hmm. if, if it's not that kind of situation, you can just tell the child no and you take those toys away and you don't let them go into that part of the house anymore or whatever. You just restrict it. But those kinds of things happen. So yes, there is uh, there is some control on on um, what you do there. But that's well, I guess if you just ended up in China, like I started out to say, that would be the same thing. If you run amok there, you'd end up in a Chinese jail, I guess. Uh, you know, <laughs> some somebody is going to uh, you know uh, kind of correct poor behavior because poor behavior is you know gets in the way of other people. And that and, um, isn't, uh, it, it isn't uh, allowed. I think some of that is the fear, you know, when people think, well, they're going to be so powerful, they'll be able to do this. And, and there's, a, there's a fear that when people are able to ha- have these gifts, use these talents, use these abilities, or develop these abilities, that somehow it won't be okay with the rest of us. It'll be counter. And I, um, that's what I have experienced in, in that there's an intimidation and a, a just, I think it's probably very healthy to be skeptical at first, but once you've experienced these kinds of things and you realize you, you only take your heart with you, when you go into these other realms and you have these other experiences, that's basically what they are looking at, these, the others who are there before we get there. They're looking to see whether we're worthy in that way. And it's not about judgment. It's more about do we fit in? Do, do we are we on par with what else is happening? And love and compassion and kindness are a big part of this equation. And it doesn't mean that you're perfect. It just means that those are attributes that are very helpful if you want to get in the bigger playing field. Yeah, that, that's true. And, and that's, you know, there are, it depends. There's lots of different places here in this larger consciousness system. And I use the word places, not because there's any 3D space there, but it's just the only word, you know, we have to use English words to describe this, and they don't quite fit, but we use them anyway. So if I use things like, you know, words like a place, it's not really a place like we think of a physical 3D space place. It's not like that. It's just an experience space, if you will. And there's some of these experience spaces where you're pretty much allowed to be, you know, free and and do what you will, and there's not so much restriction, sort of like when the kids all go out into the playground, right? The playground now is... The playground now is uh, childproof, so to speak. There's nothing there on the playground that, you know, there's no sharp objects, you know, there's nothing that'll explode, you know, it's a kind of a safe place for the kids to play. So you just let them run around and scream and do whatever they want to do because it really doesn't matter. It's a, so there's some realms like that where you can kind of go out and, and uh, just do whatever you feel like doing. But there's other places, other parts that are, that are more serious, that they're more focused on, you developing the quality of your consciousness on, on your evolution as a, as a uh, consciousness being. And your dreams are like that. When you dream at night, you interact not from your intellect, not from the intellectual level, but from the being level. And that means that in your dream, whatever scenario comes your way in the dream, your interaction is really from your core. You interact the way you are. And... You can learn from that if that interaction, if you make good choices there in that dream and you interact from right intent, then that's part of your growing and evolving process. So dreaming is just another reality frame in which we grow up. And this physical reality, our physical universe, our planet Earth and so on, that's another reality frame in which we make choices in order to grow up. So it has 
you know, that's our job here is to make choices, and we evolve or de-evolve as consciousness according to the, the quality of the choices we make. And we do that in our dreams. We do that here in this physical reality on Earth. And we do that when we're out of body in other places. So though there is some schoolyard uh, you know, places there where you can kind of just romp and run and do what pleases you, there's other places that are a little more serious and have to do with your growing up and things happen and you interact. And it's all about the quality of the choices you make in that interaction of whether or not you get to go on or whether or not you get to go back. So think of it like a schoolhouse. This is a consciousness evolution schoolhouse. And we're part of that larger systems evolutionary process. As we evolve, it evolves because we're a part of it. When you're talking about these other non-physical beings and you, you know, their impact on us, is that something everybody has a connection to? Everybody can if they are open to it and interested in it and would like to interact um, with the larger system. And uh, most people do in a way that they don't even know. That's really what our intuition is. We have intuition, uh, that little voice in our head that you know encourages us to do this or not do that. But that intuition uh, is typically just information out of the larger consciousness system. And it's information that can be helpful to us for the most part. And if we encourage that and work with it and pay attention to it, then it gets stronger and more reliable. If we uh, ignore it or feel it's nonsense or don't trust it, then it doesn't get stronger or more reliable. It just stays kind of marginal. So it's kind of up to us whether we want to make those connections or, or not make those connections. I like the way you surmised or, you know, summed up the book, the, 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 the trilogy, and you say tracking the non-physical footprint of a more fundamental reality through a consciousness wilderness or the consciousness wilderness. That's what the, my big toe is all about. I tell you what, yeah. for me, condensing that into that little sentence, that, I thought that was brilliant. You did a great job with that. Yeah, it's very difficult. You know, when I started writing these books, I, I had a pretty good idea of what it is I wanted to say. But the hard part was, how do you say it in such a way that people will understand? People who have little to no experience, you know, how, how, can I, how can you say this, that it actually sounds rational to these people? And that's really why I ended up with three books, because I, I started writing it, and I got people, I passed it around, and people would ask questions. So I'd answer their questions, and then they'd have more questions, and so on it went. Um, until I finally uh, looked at it and said, wow, there's too much here for a book. I'm going to have to break it up into, into pieces. And I ended up with three. But it's because I wanted to say it in a way that people could understand it. And my, you know, my, my um, technique for doing that was to just pass it around to people and see, did they understand it? And if they didn't understand it, then I needed to write more. So there's, there's this, it's a very slow... Um, on ramp, I guess, to the to the my big toe material. It kind of starts with a with my experiences and and how I kind of uh, ended up uh, being able to write the books, and that's real easy reading. And then it starts to get a little you know more trouble. You have a little more thinking has to go on. But I I very slowly ramp up the the concepts so that people can follow along logically. It's a long thing to spell out. When you get into this and you start realizing all of the potentials when you're doing, and I went on to YouTube to see what, how you condense this and how you consolidate it and present it in various speeches and stuff. When you're talking about things like earth changes or things like diet, um, there's, there's little aspects and you go through and you try to do things that are non-mathematical. So anybody who's mathematically challenged doesn't go into an immediate stupor. Um, but still it adds up and it has a nice equation base to it. So it, it does have a logical basis, but there's just no easy way to accept to accept if you're saying to somebody, have you had this out of body experience? Have you had a premonition? Have you had a near death encounter? Have you seen a ghost? All of that stuff fits into your equation in some way, shape or form. And then they can say, ah, okay, this might give me some more background on why and how that all makes sense. Now, does that make sense? 
Yes, that's uh, that's one of the purposes that these books serve, is that you have many, many people, I think we said earlier, like 80% of the population has experienced something paranormal. And for the most part, they don't understand it. Sometimes it's a little frightening. Occasionally, they think maybe they are you know, losing it. They're going insane or something because they get this connection and they, they really don't know how to interpret it. But it's a very common experience, but they just don't have any way to put it into a bigger context or connect it to themselves and, and their life. You know, what does this mean to me? Why, why is this happening? Uh, what's the point of it? Where is it going? And all these questions are just unanswered. And what my books do for these people is they take those experiences and put them into a logical context so they can say, oh, that's what was going on. That's what that meant. Uh, I understand now. So for, for, for some, that's, uh, that's really a big deal because they were uh, frightened. They were thinking that uh, you know, they were losing their mind or something. Uh, something very strange was happening to them. And then they find out that it's just a normal part of existence. It's not that uh, odd. So the, a lot, most of the paranormal becomes just normal when you have a bigger picture, when you understand kind of a bigger science, if you will, a bigger understanding of reality, and the paranormal isn't para, which means beyond normal. It, it's just normal. It's just not uh, in the same small box as our physical world. It, our, our reality is bigger than just this, this uh, physical reality. That's just one uh, reality frame of many reality frames, and consciousness has entree to all of those reality frames, just because it's consciousness, because consciousness is the fundamental reality. So we as consciousness can explore that fundamental reality and learn from it and be in it and have associations and business there and solve problems there, and it's just another reality frame in which you live, make choices, and do things. And you talk about splitting yourself instead of bilocating or actually physically teleporting, that you can just make another version of yourself, non-physical form, and go somewhere. And the benefit of that would be? Well, if, you can, if you're exploring these larger systems, then you can explore them in two ways. And, and again, there's many reality frames, and some of those reality frames are very much like uh, this is physical reality. It's not this physical reality. You can think of it as some other physical reality, if you will. It's another reality frame that has a reality similar to our physical universe. And there are beings there populated in that reality frame, just like we are here populating this reality frame. And if you want to interact with that frame, then you have two choices. One, you can be kind of like you're watching a movie. You can, you can uh, uh, just be a, um, you know, kind of a witness, a, a voyeur, if you want, where you're, you're, you're listening, you're hearing, you hear the interactions, you see what's going on, but you don't directly, um, well, you can interact in that you can, you can speak and get answers back, but it's all telepathic. It's not a physical-to-physical -physical kind of interaction. So that's one way of interacting with these other reality frames. And another way is to actually get physical. So you, you manifest the body, and it sounds like that's really a mysterious thing, but basically you're just insinuating yourself into a data stream. And then you can interact as a physical part of that other reality. So then you're physical there. And that uh, requires some responsibility. You have to be careful not to interrupt or create problems in that physical reality with your with your visit. So you have to be a little more aware and a little more savvy and capable before you can do that. But you can almost always go and just uh, interact uh, telepathically and, and kind of see what's see what's going on and experience it from that viewpoint. That's kind of an easy thing that's open to almost everybody. Well, there's a new movement or a recent movement or a more cohesive, coherent, um, intentional movement to try and connect with alien, uh, aliens, no, whatever you want to call them. But she's that one global term that's kind of over overstating. But um, beings who may be transdimensional, beings who may be actually physical beings, we don't really know a whole lot about them right now. But it would seem that those types of 
presences, in addition to the non-physical, non-corporeal elements who in, interact with us and engage us, whether we call them guides or whatever word we use for them, it seems that they're trying to to nudge us, to to encourage us to quit being so destructive in one way and quit being so caught up in all this manifest thing to start working and utilizing those telepathic abilities because that's what that calls to play when you work, work with this other energy. Well, yes, there's, there's lots, of, lots of reality frames and some, there are some in those reality frames that may be engaged in uh, kind of helping pull us along our path to evolution, but there's also more in those reality frames that are just as clueless as we are. So it's, it's all <laughs> the you know all those entities out there aren't uh, you know advanced and, and know more than we and so on. Some of them, most of them, are just as clueless as we are. They're stumbling around inside their own reality frame, totally oblivious to the you know to the larger reality. So it's you know there's lots of lots of different frames. Now I haven't mentioned it yet, but all of these frames are virtual realities. They're all virtual in the sense that they are information-based, and our physical reality is the same way. It's a virtual reality. It's information-based. So you have different kinds of virtual realities. You have the ones sort of like our physical universe, which have a rule set. You know, virtual realities are defined by a rule set, and they evolve according to this rule set. And if the rules are a real tight rule set like ours, then it seems to be like a physical reality. But there's other virtual realities, like your dream reality, when you're dreaming, and that doesn't have such a tight rule set. That's got a very loose rule set, so you can fly and teleport and you know change shapes and do all kinds of things uh, in that uh, jump around in time, all sorts of things in your dream reality, That uh, because its rule set isn't so restrictive. And then there's other realities that are even less restrictive than your dream reality, where you're just a consciousness interacting with other consciousnesses, and and uh, it's basically uh, like being in a chat room where you're just exchanging information and data. And another yeah, thing talking... to uh, yeah, another thing to point out to people is they receive the data, and they have to interpret the data in terms of their own experience base, which would be in terms of our physical reality. So people go out into these realms and they tell you what they saw and felt and heard and smelled and touched, but Basically, they just received data that they had to interpret into physical terms in order for them to process it, because that's, that's how our language works. Our language is based on describing physical reality. That's how our experience is, so that's how we have to interpret the data. So it's just really a matter of getting data in data streams and interpreting it to be certain things. So if you run into some non physical entity and you know you start describing that to people and you say oh you know he was a short little guy you know with a long beard wearing a green robe and so on well that's all just your interpretation that doesn't mean that that is the way it actually is it's just how you interpret the data that you're getting your interpretation may be fairly accurate or it may be way off the mark it just depends on the quality and the detail of the of the data and how much experience you have and how good you are at making uh, interpretations. Well, so, this is okay. Just to give an analogy, the, the, there was a child who saw a ghost. The ghost was described as a little little girl wearing a blue dress, and she had a blonde hair, and said she'd been in an accident. That she gave her description, and that's what the child saw. When the folks there who were trying to make it visible for us, they got pictures of this wispy, swirly, brown, blue, black thing. And they said, well, that's what it really looked like. And no, it didn't. It looked, <laughs> it's subjective. It's really subjective. It's that's how the, how it wanted to appear and imprint it on her, on the, the child who was, who was seeing this versus the adults are trying to take a picture and make this all scientific and say, okay, this is our ghost story. And this is how ghosts really look. And it's like, that's where I think we're missing the part, part of the picture. Yeah, two totally different things altogether. See, people want to make the non-physical physical. They want to take a picture of it and measure it and put it in a bottle. And, you know, they, they want to make it physical. Well, it's not physical. And it's, 
you know, so the little girl gets information and she interprets that information, you know, to be this little girl in a blue dress or whatever. And that's the data she, she has. Now, it may have just been, the data may have just been of a little girl. And, and the person receiving the data may have actually caused the dress to be blue and the hair to be blonde or whatever and put in those details because that just seemed to fit the sense of the data that she was getting. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? When you when you get data and communicate telepathically, you don't get details like you get when you are speaking a language. You're speaking a language, you know, the language is made up of letters and letters form words and words words have specific meanings. And of course our words also have have multiple meanings and sometimes vague meanings and then the interpretation we start we have to interpret what those words mean by the context. Well, it's the same way, except more so when you get telepathic information. Most of the information you get is not detailed down to the, you know, the Matt's eyebrow level of detail. It's yeah. mostly like paragraphs. You get chunks of information. You get whole paragraphs at a time, which mm -hmm. means you get concepts. You get uh, a big picture things. And then you interpret that, and you have to color the dress blue as a matter of fact, you may even have to put the dress on the little girl because all you got was there was a child. Right. You know, and a young child and a happy child and a child that was okay and this sort of thing. And you give it, uh, you know, size and dimension and color hair and color eyes and the color of the dress and all that you kind of add to it because that makes it something that you can describe to other people. But the sense was, was this nice little child, da 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 da, -da and you kind of get the sense of the child. Well, that's the way it. That's kind of the way it works. And then for these other people to come out with their machines and cameras and says, no, it was a great blob, it's just <laughs> kind of silly because that's totally different reality frame. You know, that was the perception that they had from whatever they got from their instruments, which probably has very little, if anything at all, to do with what the little girl was experiencing. That's okay. And the reason I brought that up was because in listening to the things that you're talking about, that seems to me a way to paint how far we are away from what we are experiencing and what we're trying to share because we don't have something right there in the middle that marries the two realities or marries the two paradigms. Does that make sense? Oh, yes. That's, you know, we want to make everything physical because if it's not physical, it's not real. That's kind of a belief we have. It doesn't, it's not a rational belief, but it's a, it's a belief. And scientists are, are uh, very much infected by this particular belief so that if they can't take the picture of it or see it or weigh it or measure it somehow, then it has no real existence. You see, it's not, it's not a real thing because all real things have to be physical. Well, that's not the way it is. Your consciousness is not physical. You have a physical brain, but your brain is not your consciousness. The brain is not the creator of your consciousness. Your consciousness does not live in your brain, you see. So the brain is a physical thing, but consciousness is something altogether different. And your consciousness is non-physical. Information is non-physical. How much does information weigh? You know, what, uh, how much volume does information take up? I'm not talking about, uh, you know, how much does a book weigh. A book is not information. A book is a, is a uh, media. It's paper, and ink is a physical thing that makes squiggles on pages that we interpret to have meaning. But the information isn't the book or the ink. The information is the meaning, the content. You know, what does it mean? What's, what's its point? It's, uh, oh, just, what can we say? It's the... It's the uh, subjective meaning because all meaning is subjective because there's an individual consciousness that's getting that meaning okay so we we look at that meaning and that is the information what does it say what does it tell us what do we get out of it so the content is non-physical how much does that content how much does that uh, information uh, weigh it doesn't weigh anything it's just an understanding it's all mental it's non-physical so there's lots of things that are non-physical. In fact, our whole mental world is non-physical, and that's what we're talking about when we talk about consciousness. So then you get a bunch of picture, people standing next to this little girl with their cameras and their, you know, their field effect 
uh, measures and all the rest of this stuff, well, that's kind of silly because that's not what's going on at all. What's going on is a transfer of information, of meaning and content, which is entirely non-physical. And you're not going to measure that with a machine. Machines don't measure information. They measure book and they can measure ink, but the book and the ink is not the information. That's just the media and the code symbols. The information is what you get out of that book, how you interpret the meaning from those code symbols. That's the information. Doesn't weigh anything, doesn't take up any space. <laughs> and see, it requires. It's non physical, so you don't yeah. get a picture of it when a little girl's getting information from some other, uh, you know, uh, dimension or some other place. The information is invisible and doesn't make pictures. Okay. And I thank you. I appreciate you making that point um, because I think it's critical in terms of people trying to make something out of out of a, a completely different paradigm. And uh, what I also wanted to find out more about, you talked in one of the videos you, you were, that I, I saw, and I can't remember the name of it, about the uncertainty of an event happening and such as future earth changes, that kind of stuff, or even the weather, you know, that we have the ability to shift things like that with our intent. And the more uncertain something is, the better our chances are to shift that event or shift the equation in our favor. Can you go into that a little bit? Because there are, I know people, they're running amok a lot of times with their thoughts, like doing, okay, here's the grocery list and here's a TV show I want to watch. And why didn't, why didn't my kid pass, you know, this semester, all that stuff that's going out when they really could be going back into a different way of thinking about their world and their life and giving themselves more, I think, power in the moment by focusing thoughts with intent. And that's what that addresses when you're talking about the uncertainty of certain things coming to pass where we do have an ability to shift our daily lives and the events that come to us. We, we do. Part of the way this larger consciousness system works with us as, as a virtual reality subset called our physical universe is that we get to, as feedback, because we're, we're here to learn, we said that, this, this universe is like a, a schoolhouse and we're here to learn, and a good schoolhouse has to give you feedback. It has to tell you, you know, how are you doing? What, you know, what, are, you, uh, what are you learning? What are you creating here in the this, in this schoolhouse? So we get feedback, and one of the feedback mechanisms is that what happens in the future is just probabilistic. It depends on our choices. We make choices. And a, a person makes thousands of choices in a day. Some of them are very small choices. They're not all choices like, do I reach out and grab something? Some of the choices are like, uh, let's say somebody says something that's a little rude to you and you get upset or you get angry. Well, you choose to get upset or you choose to get angry. Even though we might say, that person made me angry, it's not person that makes you anything, you choose to be angry. You have to take responsibility for who and what you are and for your choices. So we make all sorts of choices, you know, by the, by the minute we're making choices and as far as how we react and interact and what we do and what we don't do are all of our choices. Now, you take the, kind of the sum of all these choices that all the people are making and that's what ends up uh, creating this that we are in. We can modify the probability of any particular happening happening with our intent. So we help modify choices. We're all connected. All of us beings are connected. All of us consciousnesses are, are interconnected, like a big, uh, a big internet system, if you will, that all consciousness is connected to. So we have intents, and we can modify future probability with those intents. So if our mind is very scattered, and we're thinking about all kinds of things, and we're worried, and we're upset about this and that, and we're trying to control the way our life works, well, our life is going to be basically frustrated. It's going to be uh, very scattered and um, unfocused, because we're very scattered and unfocused. If we have an intention, let's say somebody is, is ill and you want to help them get better, you can have an intention for them to get better, for them to get rid of that you know, illness, whatever it is, be it you know, a cancerous tumor or a cold. And that intent will help make the probability of them getting better go up. 
Now, if the probability that they were going to get better was one in a million, because it's a, let's say it's a tumor that's always fatal and nobody ever gets better and five doctors have looked at the tumor and pronounced it to be that kind of tumor, well, now the probability of getting better is very, very small. So there's still a probability you could get better, but maybe it's one in 10 million or one in a million. And you may put your intent on that and you may move it all the way up to one in a thousand. But it's still not likely to happen because one in a thousand is still a small probability. So there's a couple of things at play here. One is the strength of your intent, which means is uh, the strength of your intent, like the, the clarity of your focus, all the thoughts out of your mind except this one, this one thought. So you have to have a clear, uh, powerful intent, which takes some practice and, and learning how to do that. And the probability that you're trying to change has to be something that you have the you know, the power to change. So let's say that a person's ill and it's about a, you know, one in 10 chance that uh, they'll get better. Well, you might move that one in 10 chance up to a one in two chance or to a one. They just may get better because a one in 10 is not nearly as hard to overcome as a one in a million. You see? <laughs> so it's, it's that kind of a game that you can play. So that means that in a, in a very large sense, we create the reality that we live in all of us together all of us collectively, with all of our intents and all of our choices, that's what creates our future. That's what creates our reality. And you can modify that future with an intent. Matter of fact, this is such a common occurrence that uh, it's part of our legal system. It's called the placebo effect. If you uh, give a, a, uh, a person with a, you know, with a kidney problem and you give them a medicine, and you say this, and the medicine's really not medicine at all. It's a sugar pill or sawdust pill or something, and you say, this is a wonderful new medicine. It just came available, and it always cures this illness. You know, you're in luck. Uh, you're going to get better now, and you give them all this positive talk. They, about 35, 40% of the people actually get cured. They, they get better. They physically get better. They don't just think they're better. The placebo effect's a real effect. It changes people's health. And it's because now they have a positive attitude as opposed to a, a frightened or fearful attitude or a negative attitude about their health. So the placebo effect is not just with medicine. You know, we see it in schools, too. A fair amount of research has been done with uh, young children in schools. They take children, uh, a bunch of children, and randomly divide them up and put them into two different classes, and they tell the teacher in, in one class that, yeah, that this is the dumb group, you know, or this is the smart group. And they find out that when you give the teacher and those children that kind of expectation, they live up to it. Yeah, the kids that are the smart group make bigger, yeah, make better grades on their standardized tests. And the dumb group don't do nearly so well, and yet they were just a random draw of children. You see, it's not that one group of children was any smarter or better students than the others. Those expectations, those, those intents that people have about those children and that the children have about themselves makes all the difference in the world about the outcome. Okay, and I want to end with that, because right now, the smart group is listening to you, Tom. The smart group is listening, <laughs> and they want your information, because we got a minute. <laughs> uh, is that all? Yes. <laughs> My time goes by I quickly know. when you're having fun. I see. Give your website because we're out of time, dude. <laughs> okay. Well, if you if you any of you listeners found this at least vaguely interesting, I assure you it actually is rational and logical, and you can find out more about it if you go to um, www.mybigtoe all one word mybigtoe.com. Thank you. You were fabulous.